in the northwest corner of Ireland, beneath heavy Atlantic skies, is Sligo. Here you won't find that oversaturated fairy tale image of postcard Ireland. This landscape was not made for export. But for all the cold winters, the endless grey days, there is something in this place that touches the deeper aspects of our humanity, our connection to the earth. It has always been this way. It touches me. And so in those brief moments when the blazing sun hangs low in the western sky, when the wind dies away on the mountain and the twilight touches the shape of the wandering earth, I turn home. I'm walking in a field behind my home. <laughs> Good girl. I used to walk this way as a kid on the way home from school or to the train station. And we would always walk past this strange feature in the land. It's a sudden ring-shaped embankment on the top of this hill. This is a rath, a ring fort, a protected uh, dwelling that could date from as early as the Iron Age to as late as the medieval period. The chronology is a whole debate for another time, but what fascinates me, what moves me, is that as a child I would walk past here, on my way home, over the same ground, over the same hill that was walked over by whomever called this place home. They're like neighbours from who knows how many centuries ago. You wish you could stretch out and, you know, know them. There's the mountains, as they've always been, and down there is the river. You know, the land is the same, it's only the times have changed. Whoever they were, their home is my home. Yeah. These people were farmers, as are most of the people who live around here. They cultivated the land and raised their cattle as valuable then as they are now. But over time, as these structures were abandoned and fell into disrepair. So too, their inhabitants and their function disappeared into the realms of folklore and mythology, which sought to explain what history could not. These raths, these ring forts became known as fairy forts, places of misfortune, sinister dwellings of otherworldly beings. Now, obviously we don't believe in magic and fairies anymore, at least I don't, but it's an underappreciated and fragile thing to know who and what came before you. Science and archaeology means we don't have to rely on stories and superstition to explain the story of us from the grasslands of Africa to me sitting in my kitchen at the time we call 2021. You know, humans have left their mark. <laughs> One second. Humans have left their mark wherever they have been. It usually survives for a brief moment in time, a couple of thousand years at best. That's a tiny margin in the time that humans have 
walked the earth and absolutely nothing on a geological scale. Ultimately, the earth is going to consume any trace of us and the sun is going to consume the earth and our galaxy, just one of millions in the observable universe, will die and that's it. But for that brief moment that we and our ancestors inhabit the earth, something deep inside us compels us to leave our mark on the natural world. And in some places, our ancestors did that in such a spectacular way that it becomes impossible to live in that place without realizing that your home has always been somebody's home. And I'm not talking about the rafts or ring forts outside, but something much, much older. <laughs> We're going to a very special place. It's an important site, not just in understanding Irish Neolithic societies, but societies within the context of the wider Neolithic across Western Europe. Neolithic means New Stone Age, which in this part of the world refers to a period dating roughly from the 4th millennia BCE to mid-3rd. It's when farming was introduced to the island, which before had been home to small groups of Mesolithic hunter-gatherer societies. The topography of the centre of Sligo is essentially glacial plains surrounded by mountains and small hills and flowing into the North Atlantic Ocean, but the distinguishing feature of Jesus Christ! Fucking rat! That was close. I nearly squished them. As I was saying, <laughs> the distinguishing feature of these mountains are the small mounds that are on top of many of them. They're quite a peculiar feature until you get up close and you realize that they're not small, they're actually huge. And that's what we've come to see. How do I look, darling? Do I look okay? Anyway, the Neolithic people who settled here cultivated cereals, reared sheep, goats, and most importantly, cattle. In Cantimeo next door, you can find the Cage of Fields, which are one of the oldest discovered organized field systems in the world. A really good example of one of these Neolithic farming communities. The climate in the 4th millennia BC, it was somewhat drier and warmer than it is today. Hence the appeal. Definitely not jealous. Anyway, they were very successful and industrious people. And wow, did they build. What did they build? Oh, these. Welcome to Karakil Neolithic Cemetery. These are called cairns. They're tombs, five and a half thousand years old. The Neolithic people who lived here built these on top of these mountains. And here, in Karakil, is one of the highest concentration of such monuments in the country. And they are everywhere. Five and a half thousand years ago, the people who lived in this land felt compelled to build these structures upon many of the mountains around here. This is a passage tomb. It was excavated in 1911. Passage tomb, much like uh, the famous Newgrange, though on a much smaller scale. And because they were excavated, we can actually go inside them, which is a very unique experience to enter the resting place of 
individuals who lived so long ago have gone. Here we are inside a Neolithic passage tomb. Behind me are the three crevices we're in. The remains of deceased individuals will be placed. I've been up here many times. It's probably my favourite place. And every time it gives you that feeling of... of... Well, I don't know how to describe it. But it's quite something. Most of these tombs have not been excavated and unfortunately the ones that were were not always done so under the best practices. Dynamite for example is not to be recommended during archaeological excavations and I think most archaeologists would agree on that. Most of these tombs you cannot actually get into. That goes for these tombs in general on this island. If you live in Sligo and have not done this why not? If you visit Sligo, I recommend this probably over anything else. It's really special. Definitely though, you don't want to be claustrophobic doing this. Once you get through the really narrow part, however, the ceiling stretches up to what easily is three meters high inside. Five and a half thousand years old. These tombs are older than Stonehenge, older than the pyramids of Giza, and they're everywhere. You can't live here without seeing them. Whichever way you face, there they are. Hello, people of the 21st century. Guys, lie to you. Don't trust them. Don't trust them. It's gonna rain any minute now. The weather here is so changeable. It can be midsummer one moment and midwinter the next. And yes, it's true. It does rain a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Before the uh, arrival of the first settlers on the island of Ireland around the 7th millennia BCE, it's estimated about 80% of the island was covered in rainforest. Yep, rainforest. Temperate rainforest, that is. Not tropical rainforest, the other type. Of course, all that was uh, gradually replaced by farmland. And so uh, today only small patches, fragments of it remain around the island. And here we are, Caramore. Caramore Megalithic Cemetery. Of the excavated tombs, the uh, contents were said to comprise of both cremated and uh, uncremated, sometimes dismembered human remains, depending on the burial practice at the time that the bodies were deposited in the tombs, along with grave goods such as uh, seashells, antler pins. The difficulty is, of course, even the most innocent looking stones can hide the secrets that we need or we covet to understand who these people were, what they did, what they were all about, what music did they listen to, what did they like to eat. And this cairn here is sort of the main event. These smaller tombs face inwards 
towards this one. It is a really, really gorgeous evening. So we're going to climb Loch Nore. <sighs> okay, onwards. It is a stunning, stunning walk. And an even more stunning view from the top. Of course, we're going up to marvel at the uh, historical monument at the top. Another Neolithic cairn. A little bit later, I believe, than the ones at Caramore and Caracil. This one is uh, at the end of the fourth millennia, about 3000 BCE. It's uh, commonly known as Queen Maeve's tomb or Queen Maeve's cairn. Queen Maeve is a mythical warrior queen of Connacht in Irish mythology. She doesn't exist, but she's definitely not buried up here. But she was queen of Connacht, this area, and I have a special affinity for this woman because my name, or my namesake, I suppose, was her prize champion, Ferdia, the greatest warrior in Connacht. Oh yeah, that's definitely me. Look at these lovely ladies. Hello, hello, hello. Here, these mounds of stones, these walls, are the remains of a village. Yes, a village up here. Uh, it would have existed until the famine times of the mid-1840s. Famine, of course, is uh, one of the darkest, if not the darkest episode in this country's history. The population of the island, pre-famine at the start of the 19th century, was over 8 million, and that was halved after the famine and continued to decline all the way until the 1950s where I believe the population of the Republic got as low as just under 3 million. Our country never fully recovered and to this day rural decay and rural depopulation persists and is a major issue. Yeah, it's a very sad story to think about. Getting near the top now. Ah, no, I'm not going to spoil it. You're going to wait. Oh, God. Come on. It's a marvellous evening. Oh, I love your punk hairdo. Oh, it's very hot. If you're watching this, if you've stumbled across this video and made it this far on YouTube and you're not one of my 20 or so regulars, please, for the love of God, just give me a pity like or something. Ah. Even the sheep are feeling sorry for me. Aren't you? No, they don't care. Why would they? They're sheep. We got the power and the door. Oh. We got the power and the door. We got the power and the door. We got the power and the door. We Leave my babe. Here we go again. We're gonna take it. We're gonna take it. We're gonna take it. Let's go. Yeah. Ah, oh, it's a perfect evening for the drone. Yeah, let's get the drone out. So, this is it. This is Sligo. This is my home. And that's all I really have to say. Sometimes it's not necessary to say anything. Sometimes it's better just to sit and reflect, especially when you're home. Up here, facing the setting sun, I like to think about what home means to me, what it probably means to all of us. It's comfort. It's safety. It's feeling connected to who you are and where you come from. It's a sense of timelessness in a world that always seems to have a little less time. I think now more than ever we need to remind ourselves just how fleeting our time is. 5,000 years passes like 5 minutes in the sunset. 
And though our time will come and go, this land will still be here. Our ancestors knew that, and they left their mark in stone on the mountain tops. Now we need to look around and ask, what mark have we left? I'll stop now.